My name is Virus. We are DC949. And this is OCTF, five years and 50 minutes. You're all in the right place. Yes, it's like gym class. Um, and five years ago, uh, we invented and implemented a little game called, uh, well, originally it was called Amateur Capture the Flag, and then it became Open Capture the Flag. And uh, I guess we'll just have everybody stand up and say their names or, you know, so sort of know who we're talking to. Adrian. Adam. <laughs> CP. <laughs> Jeff Ball. Frank Two. A Pratt. <laughs> uh, history. So, uh, five years ago, uh, me and, and this guy over here, the redhead, Adam, um, we were walking around DEF CON. Uh, this is many moon ago, back when DEF CON was uh, at the Alexis Park. And there wasn't uh, a whole lot, right now there's, a, there's many DEF CON contests. There's mystery box, there's you know, contests and badges and you know, ninja party stuff you can take apart and everybody else who has a party has a badge and you can take stuff apart and there's karaoke and there's more contests than I can possibly even you know, remember. Uh, but it wasn't always that way. There was only maybe three or four contests originally. Uh, so there wasn't a whole lot of structured activities for attendees to do. I mean, you know, you could walk around, you could, you know, get on the most hostile network on earth and play around, which was cool, but like, that was it. You know, you could talk, which is, is, is not bad, but um, uh, obviously the, the cornerstone contest of, you know, DEF CON forever is CTF. And CTF is really cool, uh, but it suffers from, from one real uh, nail, which is not everybody can play. Right? I mean, CTF is awesome. Everybody would, you know, love to bash their brains up against some of the, you know, smartest guys out there on the net. But, you know, resources are limited. Not everybody can play their game. So, um, over half intoxicated banter one day, uh, me and Adam had a conversation, and I, you know, I kind of tossed the idea. I was like, Yo, what if we, what if we made a game that was like CTF, but everybody could play? And he kind of looked at me and said, well, that's, that's really cool. I don't know anything about doing that. You, 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 you want to do that? And I was like, no, we should go find somebody to do it. So we spent a year <laughs> looking for somebody else to, to host this contest. That would be fun for us to play. It would be like CTF, but everybody could play. And it would be this giant room. And you know, we'd all have crazy hacker good times. Uh, and nobody wanted to do it. Everybody said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. You should do it. So our grandmaster plan. <laughs> was to apply for, you know, talk to, talk to the goons and be like, yo, we'll, we'll run this contest and try to run this contest. And then we'd screw it up so badly that people would approach us and say, this is a really good idea, but you guys suck at it. And then we'd be like, oh, well, you, you, please, please. Because <laughs> we had so little faith in our own abilities. So we, you know, muscled up some moxie and, and had our, our one little computer with no paint on it. And like, I think it was like a, was it an aluminum or iron case or something that was yeah, heavy yeah. as hell. We tried to host it over Wi-Fi the first year. That was really smart. Uh, <laughs> and we set out to host this contest. And it had a million problems and was hardly ever up and had all kinds of, the finger of God was like flicking us off that day. It was not, it was not mm -hmm. friendly. Um, but the few people that came out to play had a lot of fun. And at the close of the contest, people walked up to us and said, wow, that was really cool. You guys had some serious problems. You should fix it. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, not, that's not the response I wanted. But that's what we got. So, um, yeah, five, you know, it, it started really fledgling, and then you know, a few years later we were still doing it, and by the time we ended, you know, what we thought would be very simple, you know, originally amateur-esque uh, services, you know, well, games turned into just these monster, monster challenges that would literally take years to create. I mean, by OCTF 3, which is, I think, where we changed the name from amateur to open, uh, the reason we changed the name is because other people would walk up to us and say, why do you guys call this amateur? This is not, it's not easy. <laughs> I mean, not that I would claim to be some, like, super, you know, Legat-style programmer, but, I mean, <laughs> you know, it was, it was unique enough to where somebody else felt that we needed to change the name, so we did. Uh, so I guess the rest of the panel is, um, over the years, we've gotten a whole lot of really nasty complaints of stuff we did to people's computer. Uh, so I figure we'll just uh, stand up and, uh, or, or, or we'll sit. Yeah, you guys want to sit. Yeah, make me stand. I see how it is. Uh, 
and just go over, I guess, some of the milestone services, some of the ones that were really popular, the ones that people you know remember. And then at any real time, if anybody has got anything they wanted to know or questions they've had over the years or is really upset about me blowing up their computer in year three, uh, just, you know, it's a panel. So feel free to get involved. And thank you. Thanks for interrupting. Stage ninja. <laughs> stage, stage ninja. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, feel free to shoot your hands up there and just get involved. Just real quick, guys. Uh, anyone in here actually play in OpenCTF over the last five years? Oh, wow. So I was expecting no one, so my next anecdote's not going to work. Um, so yeah, we're going to cover some services, uh, and then kind of towards the end there, I think we're going to have a lot of time left. Uh, ask questions, maybe services you would like to understand how we did the back end, or what things we did and why we did them, and probably a lot about happy dance. Feel free to throw things at me. <laughs> All right. Um, one of the things that I liked running the contest was there was always a good range of services. So it didn't matter whether you were, you know, some guy off the street who, you know, didn't know a whole lot, or whether you've been doing this for years and you know, run your own pen testing company. You could come here, try and hack something, and have fun. Um, some of the stuff that I did uh, throughout the years have been crypto related, and some of it was simple, you know, telnet into this and. It gives you an, an encoded text with some custom algorithm, anything from rotation to transposition, like all kinds of different stuff. And basically, you had to solve that. And there weren't any hints. It was just, here's a ciphertext, give me back the plain text. And it, one of the other challenges that we had was it had to get harder as the contest progressed. I mean, if people were just battling back and forth, you know, two people know how to solve it, they're just going to script it, and then, you know, the server's going to get DOSed. So what we had to do was we had to make the challenges get more difficult over time at you know a reasonable rate so that people would always be able to try it and have fun. Um, so the crypto was a whole lot of fun. Um, we had some games like I did Hangman where basically you had to guess the, you know, it was Hangman. And uh, there were some different, it was web-based, you could do some different uh, injection attacks and stuff like that. Or you could just try and play Hangman and win. So, you know, however you want to attack it, by all means. <laughs> um, what else did I do? Uh, oh, one year we had uh, a whole economy set up because the, uh, one of the things we got from, I think it was year three, is someone came up and was like, you know, I really like your contest, but, and, and it's a great challenge, but it's not really like, you know, real life. I mean, this crypto stuff's cool and all, but, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, come out in the wild and say, oh, look, I'm telling it it is something, and it's giving me back a crypto, you know, it's just not going to happen. And all the, you know, real crypto is, you know, actually secure where you're not going to break it in a reasonable amount of time. So, like, I'm not going to give you that, and it's you know, more or less impossible. And if you do break it, you know, you're not going to, you know, release it here at OCTF, so you're probably going to do something else with it. Um, so what we did was we set up an entire economy. We had a bank, we had an ice cream shop, we had uh, an auction, a whole bunch of stuff. And we had different flags, you know, hidden within and, you know, basically all the websites you could hack or, you know, you could just try and manipulate the system to get what you want. Uh, more money, more credit, more stuff at the auction. We even auctioned off stuff like uh, trash from the, you know, ice cream shop, which had hints on, you know, different things on how to score. Uh, what else we have? Oh, we would oh, I was like, and, and what's great about the economy is just like the real economy, it, it kind of crashed and fell apart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that, that was before it existed. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what else did I do? Uh, Notable. There was the uh, drop down. Oh, letter drop. That one? Yeah, that one, I did a really interesting crypto one where normally you substitute one letter for another. Well, with this one, it wasn't that at all. You just rearranged the letters and you got your plain text. And that one, did anyone get that one? Uh, I think someone got it, but it was like, everyone thought it was super hard and it's like, all you have to do is rearrange the letters, guys. It's an anagram. <laughs> it's not that tough. It was like 12 characters. Come on. So it was really interesting to see, you know, 
You do things like that that you think, oh, this is gonna get, you know, smashed in the first 10 minutes. And you know, to sit there for like three hours and like people know it's there, people are trying. And you walk around and like people are trying like things you're like, okay, I, I don't know why they're trying that, but you know, good luck. <laughs> Um, anyways, it's been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. Uh, had good times with all the contestants. Pretty much know them all by name now. Um, and uh, we had a great run. And hopefully, I'm going to go check out what the, the two boyers are doing over there after I get done talking. Who's next? Nice idea, sure. What's that thing? Yeah, so, um, well, I only recently joined the uh, 949 crew, and you know when they say that anybody can just come up and help them out, they're not lying about that. My first uh, DEF CON was DEF CON 16, and I saw OCTF, and I was like, this is really cool, and these are some cool guys. I'm going to go meet up with them. And then the very next year, I was actually uh, working on a service for OCTF, and it was, it was a whole lot of fun to work with them. So the, this, I only had one service. But it was a big, massive service. Are any of you guys familiar with the text game Zork? OK, here's a few people. Good. So basically, what mine was was Zork with a zero, you know, because hackers love numbers. And um, what it was was you were in the NIST facility to imprison hackers because you know you don't want to put them in a regular prison because they're going to get the crap eaten out of them or something like that. So you put them in a prison hosted by the NIST or MITRE or whoever you really want to call it. And the idea was there was some B-tard guard who loved you and hackers because hackers are cool and he's just fucking retarded. So what he's going to do is he gives you some lockpicks to help you break out of the prison. And what you're going to do is all the guards are out at DEF CON right now because they love DEF CON too and there's only that one B-tard idiot there. So he helps you break out of prison. And the entire idea is for you to not necessarily break out of prison entirely, but to go to the, go to the yard and deface the flag with your team name. So what this involved was basically, it was exactly like a text-based adventure. You would have to pick your way out of your cell, then navigate the text-based maze and try to figure out how to go from one level to the next. And every door had a lock of some kind that you had to perform some sort of binary manipulation on it. You had to find out how to perform an exploit on the door. In some way or another, you had to get a key card and then a, a thumb drive so you could add an exploit onto your key card and then put it in the lock. And the lock would run the exploit and then you would get through the next level. And there was a final door, which is basically kind of like a, like, kind of like a, um, a key gen in a way, where it was basically a challenge response where uh, you would have to download the lock and reverse engineer it and try to figure out the algorithm. So when it gave you a question, you would have to give it a response. So as the game progressed, it would get harder and harder and harder. The exploits would get a lot more uh, difficult to perform or, or dif more difficult to figure out. Sometimes you would have to figure out where the address was going. Um, what else was there? Yeah, and the, the key generator got more and more obfuscated with every time. And how many of you guys play uh, uh, pa pen and paper games like uh, D20 games? If the DM told you explicitly to go somewhere and really, really, really told you to come somewhere, would you, would you follow them? Why would you follow them? That's so gullible. So here's what happened. Um, I, in, before you get to the library, which has a lot of key components, the descriptions of the rooms tell you, hey, by the way, you might want to go to the locker room. There's a lot of the locker room. I actually got compliments on the writing of it at least, so I mean, <laughs> yeah, and, and that was basically uh, how Zork went, and that was just a whole lot of fun to write. Who's next? So I think these guys kind of understate uh, the wacky antics 
that um, contestants do during the game. That was seriously like 80% of the fun every year that we ran it. It was just seeing the hairball schemes people would pull in the middle of the game. Like Adam was over there talking about Defconomy and how, oh yeah, it was funny because it crashed. What was really funny is after a while when people like, couldn't figure out a way to beat it, you know, to modify money, they'd just get up, walk around the room, start walking up to people's laptops. And if it was open to the, you know, their banking website, they'd just go, change. <laughs> And then people would argue with us about it cheating, and what? Not, not my fault. We, oh man, all kinds of crazy. We we had a we had a mistake one year where we, uh, in in all classic fashion, uh, left the login to a box as root root, uh, which is embarrassing for multiple reasons. A because well you know we left the box as root root you know dee, dee, dee. Um, Secondly because nobody found it for like an hour, which which is just sad. Uh, and then when somebody did find it. Um, they didn't patch the box up, so somebody else took it from them. <laughs> and, it, and then, you know, we, we, we finally figured out what we did, and we reset the computer, and, you know, we had it all back. But they decided they would be crafty, so when they gave us the box back, since we didn't want to reset it, they left a nice, a nice little cron job that would look for every, um, uh, the, the, it look, would look for the string that we tagged all of our flags with in every file on the computer and change it to their team name. The problem is their cron job um, didn't check to see which type of files it was modifying. So at some point it started going through like libraries in the computer, you know, like glibc, and just screwing crap up. So about 20 minutes into them scoring, the box just dies and they start screaming at us, what did you do? And we're like, it's not my fault, you're a bad admin. <laughs> I didn't do it. Anyway, uh, it's hard to talk about my own service because my favorite services are stuff everybody else wrote because they're really cool. Um, one of, my, one of my fun little gems that I wrote um, was called Global Thermonuclear War. I hope at least one person in this room has seen war games and gets the joke. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so Global Thermonuclear War was this web page that you would go visit. Uh, and there would be a little password field and there would be a, you know, a button. And the button would say, you know, download unlocker because that's not ominous at all. Um, so you download this unlocker and there was a binary in it and obviously it was full of you know, horrible, nasty, acid, you know, venom things that were designed to do horrible things to your computer. Um, and I hoped people would run this in VM because at one level, you know, it, it did bad things. Okay, so what this binary was, is it was a three card Monty. You'd run it uh, and you'd see three options. And you could, you know, play chess, uh, you could play tic-tac-toe, or you could play Global Thermonuclear War. <laughs> uh, if you play Tic-Tac-Toe, uh, I actually wrote a really crappy terminal version of Tic-Tac-Toe that you could play and win. And eventually, if you did win, uh, it would display uh, a, a ROT13 encoded message at the bottom of the screen that would mutate uh, every three times that you ran it. Uh, and if you uh, decoded all of them and put them together in a giant string, <coughs> excuse me, um, it would just tell you, this is a red herring, why are you looking here? Uh, and a lot of people spent time on that. I really don't know why they did. It's Rot13. It's not hard. Um, and some people actually decoded it and then thought there was something else in it instead of looking at it for hours. That's, I didn't know I could program that good. Apparently I could hide things in plain text. Uh, the chess game was just literally a link to a Windows chess game that people downloaded and eventually people like rooted that site and did all kinds of horrible things to that company. Uh, I don't even know who it was. I just picked it at random. It was the first link on Google when I looked at chess. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry for them. Uh, and if you hit Global Thermonuclear War, it would show you another three options. And those three options would say, okay, you're playing Global Thermonuclear War, which set of cities would you like to attack first? And uh, I actually took the orders from the movie, so Seattle you know, was in there, and you, know, you could decide, decide if you were gonna be the Russians or the Americans, and you'd pick one. Um, and each of these was the, was the game itself. There were three options. One option would echo the correct password uh, to slash dev null which is about as close as you were gonna get to having it give you the answer. Um, and the other two options would do, would initiate malware payload. And one of the malware payloads would overwrite uh, the first 512 bytes of every device attached to your computer uh, with a really nasty bootloader that would just say in giant ASCII art letters and like a giant middle finger, the only winning move is not to play. Uh, <laughs> and if you modified that firmware, then you got another firmware because it detected the fact that the binary is modified and it just said har har and, you know, kind of laughed at you. Uh, and the other payload would restart your computer. So you have this binary and you run it and if you're not S-tracing it, it just exits if you get it right. So what are you going to do? 
you're going to run it again. So you were very, very likely to try to run it against both horrible payloads and it would, it would hurt your machine. And I hoped people would run it in the VM and most people did. And I know at least one kid didn't because it was his first DEF CON and I had this conversation with this 16 year old kid who was crying in a corner because his box was nuked. And I tried to explain to him that, you know, it's only the first 5, 12 bytes of your hard drive, man. You could just restore it. And he was like, but, but I just formatted it because I thought it was screwed. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a whole person. Um, and again with the wacky antics, so the coolest thing about, the, about that service, I think, was how the guys who beat it ended up beating it. Um, we had two teams from Korea that year? The Vand and d Vand and d right? Yeah. So the binary, the way that it was created was, yeah, the only obfuscation in it is the key was a really stupid series of times tables. Um, and rather than try to out binary foo people that were trying to reverse it, I think I packed it too or did something stupid. Um, every time that you downloaded it, it was dynamically compiled. I actually had a uh, web script that would look through the source code of the file, change the statically encoded key in the C source, compile it just for you, and then send it to you. So every time that you looked at it, it was totally different. The key was totally random. There wasn't a way to read the algorithm out of the binary because it didn't exist. So the guys who ended up just really reaming the hell out of that service figured this out. And they wrote a Python interpreter to read and unpack the binary and suck the key out of memory when it would run and then dynamically score the game every minute, <laughs> which is just fucking awesome. <laughs> I asked them for the script. They still haven't sent it to me. So like, yeah, if you guys see this, I want that script. It's pretty cool. But yeah, that was, that was, that was one of my favorites. <laughs> All right, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna do Happy Dance last, guys, because I'm probably gonna get some stuff thrown at me. Um, awesome service. Let's awesome. see. <laughs> quota. Quota. That's the one I'm trying to think of. Which one was Quota? The movie uh, slide. Oh, movie quotes. All right, cool. So, do you, anyone? So, people who played last year. Uh, yeah. All right. Do you guys remember the one with the animated gifts? Oh, I, lo I love you too. So this was kind of an interesting service and, and I always pride myself uh, w when writing OpenCTF services to just kind of go completely out the window with it and, and just go for something crazy. Uh, this time around it was animated GIFs from movies. Oh, that's not a big deal, right? So you go to a web page, you see an animated GIF from a random scene of a random movie and there's a text box. I don't remember what it said, but it, uh, read my lips. And uh, that was it. If you were able to insert the text dialogue of that scene in the movie, you would score. So let's say uh, you, you see Neo watching Morpheus jump across the you know, buildings, and he's, whoa. If you were to respond with, whoa, you would score. <laughs> uh, and, and, and literally what it was is I wrote a series of M player scripts and M encoder scripts that would take entire movie files, convert them to raw because of the frame seeking behavior. So I filled up my terabyte drive like in an hour. I'm like, holy shit. Um, get movies convert to raw. Then I would take these sub, at, sub, t subtitle SRT files, which I had a Python script parse out all the timestamps from the Python file or uh, from the SRT file, and then uh, M encode those few seconds from each video. So I ended up with something like 30,000 animated GIFs. So if anyone wants the entire movie, uh, like The Matrix or Gone with the Wind or Passion of the Christ in animated GIF format, I have that. <laughs> um, and it, it was pretty fun. Yeah, I know. So there, there was this, uh, this random Russian Alice in Wonderland uh, animated cartoon. And uh, I heard about this. And I, I couldn't find it anywhere. And I, I searched and searched and searched the intertubes to find this thing because I figured this would be fantastic. No one's ever going to find this. And I finally find it, I finally find it in a hole in the wall forum. Uh, and it was posted on RapidShare. So I, I download it off RapidShare. I check it out. It is bizarre. It's just creepy. And it's got and it's got subtitles. So now that I have this file, I proceeded to contact RapidShare as a copyright holder and had them take it down. <laughs> <laughs> so, maybe it existed somewhere else, but probably not over the two days of DEF CON. And uh, Quota was a lot of fun. I hope you guys had fun with that. Uh, 
I guess I guess one of the things you had to do to beat that would be to I mean did anyone actually script a response or did you just watch the movie and like pull out the subtitle file like oh, I think he said this no no one actually scripted awesome I, I figured the best way to do it in a scripted fashion would be to do some sort of frame seeking behavior and, and look at the different frames of the GIF and then seek through the video file and look for the same files or uh, same frames but I don't fucking know how to do that so um, Toastier? Yeah. Toastier. Uh, which one was that? Uh, the, the OCR? Q, the quick cube. Alright, so um, did anyone play two years ago when there was like the, cu- the custom alphabet written in div tags? No. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it better than that. Give me a break here. Oh, yeah. So you, you go to a web page and you see a word or a sentence and I think it got longer with time and it basically was uh, a custom alphabet that I wrote um, well, in JavaScript with Ajax uh, so I could draw on my screen and create an entire alphabet and then print it back to you. It was basically an OCR challenge but the characters had uh, well different sizes and backwards and Quake logo for the Q a few other weird things but what's great about it was uh, what, the, the best way to do this logically would be to look at the source code and you know figure out what the characters are, where they're coming from. The problem is the alphabets are drawn onto the screen using floating div tags in a random order. <laughs> God bless you. Uh, so this, I mean, I, it, I suppose you could extrapolate the points and write something that would put it all together and figure it out. But uh, again, I don't know how to do that. Um, <laughs> rid of death. So, I mean, to even get to the source code, if you if you tried to look at the source code, uh, it used a series of client side obfuscation techniques that I, I developed uh, for a previous talk on um, hacking with Firefox and using Firefox as a scraping platform. Um, it was it had flash uh, flash one time padding, flash encryption, uh, which just hooked into the. Uh, what's that called? JavaScript? No, the, the, the hook function. No. Java, JavaScripts. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that one was all right. Enjoyed it. Do I have to do them all at once? Can you spread, spread them out a little bit, guys? There you go. Um, so did anybody play, like, three years ago who played an audio service called Banshee? You remember that? Maybe listen to the wacky, like, portal sound. Yeah. So nobody got it. Uh, one, one, the person who came closest. No? Oh, right. Somebody did. Somebody did get it. No one saw Kate Radio. They got Banshee, I think. I don't remember. I, I don't think anybody solved it. Um, so, so Banshee was uh, an internet. Well, okay, it was a WAV file. You download this WAV file, and it was the. You know, portal song. You know. It, it was it was cool, and it was really staticky. And if you listen to it, uh, the static would only appear at certain intervals in the song. It would be constant throughout the song, but the intervals between each tick in the static were deliberate, because the static was an MP3 file in the WAV file. And if you took uh, all of the data of all of the static out of the file, which you should have been able to do because the distances between the ticks were the same. It was at exactly four, 44,001 kilohertz. So every one it would, it would count. Um, and it was this big binary blob. And the first chunk of it was an MP3 file. And the second chunk of it was the first half of a one-time pad. The second uh, half of that one-time pad was read to you uh, by a computer in that MP3 pl- in that MP3 file, so you'd have to listen to it and type it. This was supposed to be really simple <laughs> at first because it only used four characters. The idea was you'd be able to type these four characters and zorm them together and have the answer. Uh, and every time that somebody scored, the wa- the code that created the WAV file would recalculate everything that I just explained. So the idea is that the message would get longer. So the longest message. Uh, that it would ever use is uh, the Microsoft Sam voice reading the entire hacker's manifesto backwards. And you'd have to type all that and then it would, it would compute. Uh, but I don't think anybody ever got it. So if anybody's curious as to how it worked, that's how it worked. <laughs>
Can you put we the get pictures the, uh, up? Laptop on the uh, put CB's here. laptop on. Hello. Hello. Thanks. All right. From the service I did, it was really simple looking. You just get the red dot to the green dot. Put in left, right, up, or down. Not hard it's at the beginning. You get 40 seconds to do a 10 by 10 maze. So really simple. Then it progressively got harder. You see there, that's level 50 out of 300. You just, right now, it would start out black and white, and then it goes to the colors are off by like one red, green, blue value. So you're not doing it by hand. And then you also got like 40 at the beginning and down to 10 seconds at the end. And so after that, I figured too easy. So I started to draw some lines and circles on it. And then people might you know, be looking at the difference in the walls and the background color. So then I started drawing alpha transparent rectangles on it. Because <laughs> really, I didn't want it to be easy. So, And then uh, I also started changing file formats in case they, that made a difference. Some people were telling me they just threw out any JPEGs and kept refreshing. So. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of tried to combine them all, who knows. But, and then eventually it got too easy even after all the rectangles, so I figured I'll just take a seventh of the pixels and just throw them out. And just start drawing different colors all over the place. Uh, I actually, there were two teams that scripted it up pretty nicely, although they know that I bumped the level up to 300 at the end and neither of them could score, so <laughs> it's kind of sad about that. I would like to see the source of the bots if anybody's got it. I enjoyed writing several services uh, for host ETF over the years. Uh, let's see, they were uh, in no order, almost FTP'd, uh, HTDVD, BVDB. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's so much funnier if I say it quickly. It's even more funny if CP says it. He does it so much better than I can. I, I believe the challenge name was HDDVD, BVD, BVD, BVD. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and just the joy that I would feel in my heart hearing CP say that <laughs> inspired me to write this service. So what this service was, was there was this daemon that would just kind of output a video file and the poor recipient of the video file would have to figure out what in the heck is in there. They'd have to you know, break it down, see what text or clues is in there to to get the input necessary to change the flag and score. Uh, originally, I just was making all these videos by hand, but after speaking to CP one night when I was almost done, he said, you know, that, that kind of stinks. You should probably make it so that it, you know, gets a little harder every time automatically. Otherwise, we're going to run out of levels and and people will be sad. And then I was pretty tired and wanted to stop working on this that night, but so I was kind of giving him some flack about that. But I called Adam that night to get a second opinion, and he said, yeah, that kind of stinks. You should probably take care of that. <laughs> so <laughs> at that point, I pretty much rewrote the whole thing so that it would take a video, uh, convert it, compress it, render text onto each frame, and then output that, and get a little harder each time. It would do all these weird transitions, like uh, it would do kind of Rubik's Cube style filters on the videos and, and change various aspects about it. It was fun to do, though, because it was really educational. <laughs> In those several hours that it got rewritten in, I had to learn, let's see here, how to, how to have, how to write a program in Perl that would render text onto a custom video format and how to mess it up Rubik's Cube style and, and all sorts of jazz like that. And then the night before, maybe it was two nights before, I think it was the night before we actually left California for DEF CON, I realized the hard way that 
the banner command, which is what I was using to render text onto these videos, is apparently not the same banner command all the time. There's apparently a BSD banner and there's a GNU banner. The one I based, uh, based the program on was BSD banner and Slackware and the contest was running on Debian which had the GNU banner command and so there was more education there <laughs> <laughs> and let's see here, I, I wrote a chat program as I think part of the ice cream shop clue delivery kind of strategy. They'd give you some good clues and some misinformation as well and and half of the chat and banter that was in there came from Adam and I just being in a Yahoo chat one night, just some hacker chat room and so we'd just pull out random quotes, change the names to protect the innocent and you know, enhance some of the more boring quotes to make them interesting and a lot of them didn't even need to be modified. So there was one quote to this day I still can't understand. Now correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't it? What? He's looking at, me, He's looking at me. Yeah, I'm looking at him. You get out of the way. <laughs> wasn't it a forklift will shift it goo? It was, they had the most ridiculous things that, yeah, they didn't make any sense at all. It was great. <laughs> and and that was just fun because apparently you can make a chat program and our chat server and I don't know like four lines of bash. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. By the way, we're gonna release uh, a bunch of our stuff so that you can actually see his videos as opposed to just hearing a description of them. And you get to play with all the other stuff like uh, stuff the nukes your boot sector and stuff CP made. And uh, I had a backdoor in my chat program which didn't really go very far because. Um, of the previous years where we were messing with everyone, they kind of knew if you download code from us, you should probably take some precautions before you run it. That sounds like a great lead at the happy So, days. yeah. Um, Adrian? I helped out with the service last year that was IRC based. Um, Merlin wrote most of it, so he deserves most of the credit, but he's not here right now, so I'm going to do the best I can. Uh, we had a couple IRC services and we, we tried to encourage people to hang out in IRC with us and we were going to give them hints about how to score and what to do. But as it turns out, a lot of people had their own custom IRC clients and even a couple of teams that were doing really well in the contest couldn't stay in our IRC channel because they trusted the server too much. And we ended up crashing a couple of computers by just catting a 10 megabyte ASCII art of long, of long cat. And <laughs> this actually brought down a couple of computers, I believe, from the Facebook guys. <laughs> so we found that pretty amusing. Um, I think Big Pimp and Thuggalots was one of the few teams that actually managed to stay in our server for most of the time without getting disconnected. And I, they scored most of our, I think they scored most of uh, the IRC points. But, uh, I can't even remember what most of the flags were and how they worked. <laughs> so, who's next? All right. Does anyone remember Happy Dance? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <sighs> Happy Dance was probably the best service I ever wrote. It, it took me eight months total because I didn't really know anything about Firefox development, and uh, it was it was two faced. You were, go to a web page and you're presented with uh, what was that movie? Uh, I don't know. Boondock Bund Saints. Yeah. No, the, there's an animated gif oh, of. Uh, not yet. Not yet. No, that was after you get the no. You can put it in the login. Anyway, I don't remember. Uh, you go to the web page, get a login. You try and you try and attempt to uh, log in, and it tells you you're missing something. And just under the t under the text that says you're missing something is a link to addons.mozilla.org, which we're spoofing locally. <laughs> uh, so you go there, and because it looks like addons.mozilla.org, uh, Firefox and you know implicitly trusts it, and it takes one little click for you to install the Happy Dance authentication extension, which you know authenticate authenticates you to Happy Dance you know authentication portals. 
And uh, I was really kind of surprised how many people did this. I think it was just about everyone uh, playing the contest. And they install it, restart Firefox. Firefox back, comes back on, and like, well, uh, I got that link after I went to this went to this service. I'm going to go back to this service. I'm going to log in again. Well, this time you fail the login, and you you get told why. You're like your password's wrong. You have no access. But something's different. And you go back. Like, what's the most basic thing I can do to a login form? SQL injection. So use the typical textbook example of SQL injection. And there you go. You scored. You own the flag. You're scoring OpenCTF now. Shit, that was easy. Why, why was that so easy? Well, because as soon as you installed the extension and restarted Firefox, it would send a plain text, plain text AJAX call back to a local server uh, with all the stored passwords in the Firefox password manager. Uh, Keyword plain text, which means it was on the whole game and nobody said anything. All you had to do was sniff and wonder why your passwords were leaving your box. And nobody did this, including you feds who got raped. <laughs> I'm only a dog. I only know things like sit and food and rape. <laughs> um, so yeah, the Ajax call would go out, send all your passwords to our local server in plain text. And the, re the return data would be arbitrary commands that would execute on the system. At first, it didn't really do anything. You know, give them a few hours. Just so every time a new window opens, every time Firefox starts, it does this. So the traffic increases like 20% with plain text passwords going back and forth. And uh, after a while, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, so I feel we're at a hacker con. We're playing in a hacking contest. These are hackers. They're not going to be dumb. They're not going to have stored uh, passwords in Firefox. They're not going to log gonna... in from work boxes yeah. that, you know, have stored credentials that they use for work on major, you know, Fortune 1000 company websites like, oh, I don't know, Cisco or Sun or Oracle or <laughs> internal sites with product licenses or universal gateways like 1.1.1.1 .1 .1 .1 on their corporate networks. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it, it was a lot of fun because it was so fucking easy. Like, oh, you scored. Yeah, you scored. You win. And uh, no one really looked at the source code because they well, kind of freaking couldn't. It was obfuscated out to about 47 pages if you were to print it out of size 2 uh, text. Uh, because I did this whole custom uh, obfuscation in, in uh, Python and a bunch of other stuff that was all in math, like cosine and sine waves, and it just decoded the actual text. And no one actually solved it. In fact, I believe one or two teams tried to uh, decode it manually by hand. Uh, and I think they got pretty far after the first day. And I think one person did get it by the end, because all you really had to do is wrap the whole thing in a document.write, and the, it evals out and will print out the original source code. Someone goes, hey, CB, uh, you, you got the source code of the Firefox extension? And I knew this was going to happen, so I reached out and I, there you go. Handed him the stack of uh, printed out source code. Uh, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> like, You're an asshole. I don't have it on me. But um, one, one of the things Happy Dance did, like I said, was the uh, arbitrary command execution. This was great because I could tell it to send another password back to me or uh, send up an alert box. And I, I, every now and then I'd be like, all right, I'm going to make it say, CP is thirsty. And every now and then someone will bring me a drink, like, what the hell is that about? I'm like, oh, you must be compromised. <laughs> and uh, yeah, one guy's like, hey, how'd you do that? I'm like, well, I don't know. You tell me. And uh, <laughs> yeah, after, after a while, we made it so every time you scored, it would uh, remove the JavaScript limitation from your browser so there's no script escape. Uh, we load up Goatsy, or, or Meatspin, rather, and then we freeze your browser. So every time you scored, you yeah, you got points, but now you got to restart your browser, which by the way sends your password back and checks for more commands to run. <laughs> well, uh, and uh, that, that was a lot of fun. So w w one of the command trips, five minutes. Yeah. Five minutes. All right. One of the uh, command tricks I was doing was I'd send it new location data, so the browser would just go to <laughs> jump around the screen. Uh, all right, that's that's pretty fun. A big deal. Um, but the greatest part, the greatest one, was sending the restart command to Firefox. See the gears turning? <laughs> Firefox turns on, sends passwords, checks for, checks for command to run, runs the command, oh, restart. 
Restarts Firefox, sends a password, checks for command. Oh, restart. So you see Firefox popping in and out, popping in and out, popping in and out. Again, plain text. Nobody <laughs> saw it. So, I mean, you know, dozens of times a second, the, 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 you know, 300 people have their laptops turning on and off, or the Firefox turning on and off and on and off and on and off. And there's this kid, I still remember this because I feel kind of bad about it, but he's sitting here on his Windows XP box with his head in his hands, just not able to do anything because the Firefox is popping in and out. <laughs> he uninstalls Firefox. He reinstalls Firefox. It's still there because he didn't delete his profile. <laughs> Additionally, the extension removed itself from the installed add-ons list, so you couldn't uninstall it unless you were in safe mode. Five minutes? We done? Uh, Quick, uh, I think we'll be outside if anyone wants to do Q&A. There's like a room over there. There's a... There's like a room in the that way yeah, general direction. Yeah, I'm heading there after that. So uh, thank you guys so much. We had a lot of fun doing OpenCTF for the last five years. It was an amazing learning experience, uh, experience an amazing teaching experience, and uh, a very exhausting experience. So. <laughs> Uh, check yeah, out the word, guys. Word, word of the wise, those of you who ever intend on running a contest at DEF CON, um, take the amount of time you think it's going to take you to make it and then triple it. You might get close. <laughs> By the way, real quick, check out the new OCTF. Uh, Live and Dead and his crew, the Tube Warriors, have taken it over now. And I uh, expect really good things from them. Thank you, guys.